Welcome, RTO superheroes, to another episode of our podcast. Today we have a special episode where the tables are turned. I'm thrilled to introduce our guest, Lauren Hollows. Lauren is an educational visionary and a passionate advocate for building better education systems and services. She is the founder of Anywhere Education Services, and she's dedicated to providing quality, compliant, and accessible assessment tools to educators. With a wealth of experience in business coaching, team development, resource development, and RTO compliance, Lauren excels at identifying ways to improve and streamline processes within the educational sector. She is passionate about using education to make a difference, fostering staff engagement, and enhancing business maturity. Lauren is also the driving force behind Learning Lifelines, a not-for-profit organisation aimed at closing the digital divide and providing equal education and economic opportunities. She believes in the transformative power of education. Today, Lauren will be wearing the interviewer's hat and will be asking me about some of the exciting developments and challenges in the vet sector. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hi guys, this is Lauren Hollows for NOI Education Services and we are back with our YouTube Roundtable series. And today we are going to be talking all things assessment, one of the RTO's favourite things to talk about. And I am lucky enough to be here with Marie from Compliance Assist and the vivacious Angela from the Vivacity team. Thank you very much, ladies, for joining me. Um, I'll give you guys just a quick minute to introduce yourselves. Angela, do you want to kick us off? Okay, hi. Uh, So as Lauren said, my name is Angela Connell-Richards. I am the owner of Vivacity Coaching and Consulting, and we've been helping training organisations to get compliant, save time and save money since 2009. I've been in the training industry for over 30 years and I've seen many changes in legislation and how we've been governed over the last 30 years. So I'm very excited to be part of this project of Lawrence. Awesome. Marie, over to you. Um, my name is Marie, as I've been introduced, and I, um, I'm also a consultant with Compliance Assist. Um, I've, I've probably been in the, the vet industry for more than 20 years. Um, I've had my own RTO and, uh, you know, had to walk walk the talk in, in, uh, in running that. Um, I, I think I've, I've, you know, as Angela said, been in the system and seen a lot of changes, um, but a lot of changes that haven't really been changes. So um, it's it's a case of you know staying the same, but but you know with with different um, uh, words around it. So here we go again with um, a new set of changes and new words around those, and um, looking forward to unpacking them a bit more. So obviously assessment continues um, and it's interesting. I've had a few conversations with RTOs who are like, no, no, there's nothing new in the standards. Everything's the same. And obviously, particularly with regards to assessment, I think people would be looking at that and going, well, it's just 1.8 has just gone to 1.3. It's still the, you know, um, principles of assessment, rules of evidence. Nothing's changed is what it is. Uh, Interested to get your guys' thoughts on whether or not you feel that these are same, same, whether they're, you know, same, but the language has changed. Um, so what are your thoughts on kind of these broad standards? Marie, we might kick off with you. Um, thanks, Lauren. Um, I, I think, as I said um, previously, when we talked about a previous standard, I think some of the devil is in the detail of the the wording. Mm-hmm. Um it, I noticed that you know we, we we're really talking in in this these two standards in particular around the assessment systems, um, as you know, and I think that we sometimes, I, I think RTOs sometimes really focus on the assessment tools rather than the system itself. And I, I think for me, when I read this, I, I think that that's one of the changes that I'm seeing or, or a shift in focus, if you like. It's looking at an assessment system as a whole um, as, as you know, previously, you know, it tended to be on the tools or the instruments. Um, and, and I think that 
for me, that is one of the changes. Of course, 1.3, um, B and C in particular, are fairly significant changes um, uh, about the assessment tools being tested prior to use and then using that testing to actually inform changes, a continuous improvement approach, um, but also, a, you know, a, a test it before you use it, um, you know, which is, which is obvious to most of us, but obviously needed to be um, spelled out a little bit more in these standards. I, I think that in one one point four, when the, you know the principles of assessment have not changed, the the rules of evidence has not changed. I think what has changed is well. It, it hasn't really changed. It says assessment must be conducted according to this. Um, and that's not any different to what it was. But do we truly understand what that means? So that's my take on it. Absolutely. Angela, your thoughts? Okay. So um, I agree with, um, you know, the, the rules of evidence and principle assessment. And I, I, I'm i glad they kept that in because I think it is actually a really good way to be able to validate your assessment tools to ensure that they are um, fair and equitable and, and uh, that they are meeting the compliance requirements. But yeah, it's the testing. This testing is going to be we did the, um, our team did the pilot uh, at the end of last year and we had very interesting conversation with our team with, well, yes, we can help with testing, but how are the small RTOs going to go with testing? And what is testing? What Like how, how are they defining what is a test? Is testing assessment validation or is testing actually testing with the trainers and that was something that we came up with is that perhaps it would be the trainers and assessors that would actually put them through themselves through the tra the assessment and complete the assessments themselves and that's how they're testing it or are they getting a pilot group and testing it with a pilot group so uh, I'm I'm really interested to see when the user guide comes out um, so they're going to be working on the second half of this year. What does ASQA see will be testing? Yeah, I agree. I think that the testing component is definitely going to be um, super interesting. And I guess one of the things that I'm interested to find out, because obviously there are so many words in these new standards that kind of jump out from an audit perspective, um, ASQA is not going to be able to have I, uh, or at least I don't believe, I mean, they could do, but I don't believe that they're going to come out with like a super comprehensive definitions guide of like, you know, what does, you know, what does testing mean or what does, you know, like each of these terms, um, you know, for the previous standard, what does engage mean? What does motivate mean? I don't think we're going to see them coming out with like, you know, a clear guidance and definition because they they don't want to be overly prescriptive. But where terms aren't defined, is it then up to the RTO to go out, engage with industry, engage with consultants, um, create their own definition as to how they're going to interpret and implement that and then be able to justify that in order? Is that a valid approach for RTOs to take, especially at the moment when we don't have things like user guides? Um, you know, when realistically those, you know, we still don't have a credential policy. Um, come on, I'm just seriously. Um, you know, like, is that is that really the only rational approach that RTOs can take to kind of navigate their way through this when they're updating their policies, when they're thinking about how they're going to implement new processes and things like that? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, I, I think as well, Lauren, we're, we're talking about words and, you know, words words can be terribly powerful. Mm. Um, and I think when I saw a previous draft of these standards come out, this, this you know, 1.3 in particular was, was basically using the word validate or pre-validate prior to use. And I think, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the feedback that I saw go through was, you know, don't use the word validate because it has a different meaning in, in terms of, you know, what what we've understood that meaning to be. And, and so now this word, you know, about tested prior to use, you know, I, I wonder whether it's, it's sort of, you know, we're, we're getting tied up in the, the meaning of the word. Mm. Um, I personally believe that, Oh my God! Um, this it shouldn't have to be in the standards, but obviously, you know, it shouldn't have to be prescribed. But surely, 
you know, you would be actually um, looking at whether you use the word tested, but, you know, the, the next part of it is in, for me, I mean, to, to ensure that assessment can be conducted in a way. So, so it's less about the testing, but it is, you know, does this assessment work? Is it the right method? Um, you know, are we assessing um, our practical skills in a way that, you know, really, um, you know, are, are consistent with valid, with, with the, the principles of assessment? So it's, it's whether, whether we look at the, you know, I think a lot of people might look at this um, and interpret it that we, you know, you have to pilot this. I, I don't know how you get on piloting with a group of people and giving them an assessment that really doesn't work um, and it doesn't meet all the requirements. And what happens at the end of that pilot when you have all these learnings and discoverings and go, well, I'm sorry, but I can't give you actually, you know, the piece of paper that you've done um, because, you know, really this assessment didn't work. The tools didn't work. The, you know, they weren't in the right sequence. The recording, um, you know, tools that we were using, um, you know, didn't have enough. In all of those sorts of things, you know, the, the benchmarks were not, you know, able to be interpreted reliably. So I think when we, we're using the word testing them prior to use, um, I'm seeing that as a critical part of what you should be doing, you know, um, as part of you've developed an assessment system, make sure that it can do what you want it to do or that it needs to do, um, you know, rather than it being I have to trial it on group students there, you know, um, what, what happens if you trial it and find out that it really didn't meet the requirements? What, what happens to all those students? Um, that's, that's my initial thought. Yeah. Um, okay. So from my perspective, I because um, we've got a whole other thing that's happening. We've got the qualifications reform as well. So all of the training products that we have are going to be totally different to what what we're used to now. So, um, so I was interested with this being placed in here that we you know it's very similar. It's very it's validation. It's it's a rules of evidence principle assessment. But how is that going to tie in with the new qualifications reform and how we're going to be delivering training? So I'm actually expecting that we'll most probably have another change in the legislation once we get the new qualification reform. When that happens, uh, who knows when it's going to happen. Uh, to be, we're supposed to be in the third year of the rollout uh, and it started with, uh, according to their roadmap, it's supposed to be we're in the third year. Uh, the first part was micro-credentialing. So it was very interesting with how really encouraging RTOs to take up micro-credentialing and, and build micro-credential courses. But I haven't seen a lot of change happening with that, and I haven't seen a lot of change happen with the qualifications reform as well. So um, testing, is it just another word for validation or is it we are validating the assessment tool and then trialling it and testing it? I remember back when I was a trainer assessor many, many years ago, uh, and I used to write assessment tools and test them on my students all the time um, because I had no choice. So it was like the RTO I worked for, that, uh, that was my re um, responsibility to write assessment tools, and I would uh, write the assessment tool, test it. That didn't work. Better change that and gather more evidence. Um, and it was a constant to and fro with, with, okay, let's see if this works. If it doesn't work, oh, hold on, the students didn't understand that. Maybe I need to change the wording of the questions. And this is something I think all trainers and assessors should be doing now. They should be uh, adjusting their training and assessment uh, tools as they're using them. And I call this, uh, you know, you've got pre-assessment validation, post-assessment validation. This is validation during assessment. Let's, we should be uh, changing and adapting our assessment tools to meet the student needs on an ongoing basis and making sure that they work. And I mean, this is, I mean, think, I think this is where, because I mean, all of us came up probably through that era of like, hey, you're training on Monday, here's your class, this is what you'll be teaching, 
you will now need to spend the week in creating your assessments, creating your training materials, creating your this, that, and the other. It was like, oh, okay, cool. All right, no worries. Um, but now in this era of like everything, like everything has to be so clearly evidenced, trainers have been removed from that assessment, like that assessment design process in particular. Um, I think the good RTOs do take on feedback from their assessors of like this question, this question isn't working. This, you know, we're going to make an, an adaptation in this way. Um, but I also get the fear of so many compliance um, and, you know, curriculum development people that turn around and go, if you change my tools, right, actually, no, sorry, you actually can't change my tools. Like, end of the story, you can't change my tools. If you're going to make a change, you need to submit this form, you need to go through this process. And a lot of trainers look at everything that they've got in their thing and they go, Look, it's, it's, I'm putting that in the two hard box. So yeah. I find it interesting that this has been brought out of like 1.5, which is very specifically focused on validation. And I think you're both right in that this is definitely meant for providing clear evidence that before you just roll it out, so you don't go and buy the off-the-shelf assessment tools and roll them out directly to your students, that there is some process that happens before that occurs to make sure that what you're going to be doing is going to, as you said, like meet your assessment system. Um, you know, the interesting thing, as, as you were talking about before, Angela, you are talking about AI. I think one of the interesting things is, is like, who is going to be doing this? Does it have to be done? Like, because validation very explicitly says it has to be done by people who hold all of these things, right? This assessment testing does not have that requirement to it as such. Um, so I wonder if this is like one of the areas where we can look at it and make the argument and go, well, look, we have a system that does this. We have a, you know, we utilize AI to test yeah, it. I test, my, I test my questions with AI all the time. I go, here's the question, give me an answer. And if it gives me an answer that's like way left of field, I'll go on to a different AI. So like if I test it in GPT, I'll then go and test it in Gemini and go, well, what do you think? And if both of them are coming up with something completely different, I'm going, I'm, I'm phrasing this question in the wrong sort of way, right? Mm -hmm. So is that me testing my tools? You know, you're like, but it's not a person testing my tools. You know, it might be a, like I I created some recipes last night for a baking unit and then I ran them through ChatGPT and I went, do they meet all of these requirements? Like, uh, so I was just testing myself to kind of go, okay, have I covered everything? And he was like, well, you haven't explicitly covered this. And I was like, I have covered that. But you're right, I haven't explicitly covered that. Do you know what I mean? Like, so mm. is that testing? Because it's done, you know, I, I think this is one of the areas where we, we could see some of these sorts of things come into play. And I think something that's really important that we need to focus on is it's not just testing the tool, it's testing the tool in specifically for your learner cohort. So it's, it's who is who is your target market, who is outlined on your training and assessment strategy, and how are you ensuring that your assessment tools are meeting the requirements of that learner cohort? I think I think that's one thing that we really need to be incorporating in, and and it, it doesn't specifically say that in here, but it is part of our learner journey. Is that we're ensuring that we're delivering training and assessment that meets the learner cohort needs, and no one assessment tool can't meet all the different types of learner cohorts that are out there. So we need to contextualize it for our learner cohort. Thank you for joining us at the RTO Superhero Podcast with me, Angela Connell Richards. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Each rating and review helps me fulfill my goal of helping training organisations around Australia to learn and grow in compliance and business success.